Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Welcome to this week. Yes, we're back after an eventful summer in which former Prime Minister Call Me Dave announced he was also stepping down as an MP to spend more time with his family, as long as he can remember which pub he left them in. Jezza, the once and future leader of Labour, was criticised for saying he would not invoke NATO's Article 5, triggering a military response should Russia invade the Baltic states. But surely from Jezza's point of view, he's right. Russia wouldn't need Britain's help to conquer Lithuania. And a new character filled the airwaves for several weeks this summer called Jim, the washing machine salesman. Apparently he's part of an outreach program for young migrant men. That's J-I-M, and his tumble dryers are really big. I myself have been part of this humane program and spent much of the summer meeting Romanian immigrants posing as John the car mechanic. All went fine until they tried to drive away their cars. In other news, the air has been thick with the products of selective schools warning us of the evils of selective schools while sending their own little darlings to selective schools. Surely social services should be intervening to stop such cruelty. But most of all, we are delighted to have you back, dear viewer, because we discovered this summer that we have a rival for your affections. Yes, Diane Abbott, also known as Madame Mao, uh, who we always thought hailed from this manner, revealed to the Nigerian Guardian newspaper, it's a must-read run these parts, that she had a late-night Thursday TV show of her own on the BBC. It's been going for 30 years, she said, and is really rather popular, she added, modestly. Who'd have thunk it? We're just relieved some of you are still watching us. Speaking of those who live in a fantasy world, we're joined by two MPs who thought they once had a career in politics. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. One time agony aunt and Labour MP Lisa, hashtag Northern Soul Nandy, and former Tory culture vulture Ed, hashtag Maroons Camerooned Vasey. Your moment of the week, Ed. Mine. <coughs> It's been a bit of a bitty week. I don't think there's been anything that kind of defines it. So I picked out, selfishly, as I'm an Oxfordshire MP, the fact that Oxford University came top of a survey of the best universities in the world. And it's a Times Higher Education Supplement survey. And it's the first time mm. a British university has come top. And I picked it out partly because it's obviously a great thing for Britain. But also, the whole Brexit Remain debate will take this. And the Remainers will say... Yes, Oxford's a great university because it's open to the world and it has research coming from all over the world and Brexit is going to destroy it. Let's see where it is in five years' time. Right. And the Brexiters will say, stop talking Britain down. Look at this. We've now got the best university in the world. We've got all these amazing assets in this country. We can go out and trade with the world. But there wasn't a single non-British EU university in the top 30. In the exactly. List. And there are very few... And there was few... Cambridge and Imperial were also in the top 10. Exactly. And there are very, very few good European universities. They have some big problems in uh, some of the big European universities. And, of course, the other thing was a lot of Chinese universities now entering... Indeed, and getting uh, better, entering too. ...entering the table, yeah. Lisa, your moment. Mary Berry. It's got to be, hasn't it? It was huge. So, she, you know, for anyone who's missed it, I don't think anyone could have done, but she's not moving with Bake Off to Channel 4. So, basically, it looks like Channel 4 has spent £75 million on a tent and Paul Hollywood. See, I don't... When you do these negotiations, surely you make sure... Because these shows are, are led by their talent, unlike this programme, which is held back by its talent. Um, surely you, part of the deal is that the, you lock in the talent to move with the show. I don't know. It's really strange because... So three of the four presenters have mm. now said that they're going. But apparently they're getting a new BBC show. So oh. I don't know, maybe this show needs a bit of sprucing up, maybe it'll be getting a new presenter. Well, it's been 13 years, frankly, since I've been on this show, and it's struggled mm. hugely, because mm. I was on the previous show, Yeah. and it did really could well. Do, I mean, now it could now do, I'm back, it might actually... Could you know, do with a, you want to bring back the midnight hour? <laughs> yeah, I do. A woman presenter, maybe, someone with a bit of baking experience. No, it's about time. 
I used to go on. I think old... I might call Channel Four. <laughs> see if there are any vacancies. How much do you think Channel Four would buy this program for? <laughs> well, I think at least a daily politics mug. <laughs> and would they want to keep you? Or I, would I, that lower I think the price, the price would of they buying it would be they wouldn't. Anyway, enough of this. Their mistakes. <laughs> enough of this foolishness. Andrew, Mary, Barry, Neil. <laughs> I think I need to get an agent. You're not doing much these days, Ed. Not, you I've got a lot of spare. Anyway, <laughs> what are the words automatic reselection mean to you? Perhaps it's replacing Michael with Ed Vesey on the This Week Sofa or swapping the shortbread in your diet for a sugar-free alternative. Jam, perhaps. It's not really sugar-free. But for the Labour Party, deselection is an idea whose time might be nigh. With Mr Corbyn looking likely to be re-elected by an even bigger majority than his first victory only a year ago, calls for more centrist Labour MPs to be deselected are gaining momentum. I choose my word carefully. So is this the end of the Labour Party as we know it, or a brave new socialist dawn? Here's veteran Labourite Ken Livingston with his take of the week. Well, no matter how you spice it up, hard to make the present situation in the Labour Party look terribly attractive. These backstabbing MPs have had the right to challenge Jeremy. Why can't they be challenged with reselection um, in the run-up to the next election? I, the simple fact is every politician in America is subject to a primary before they can stand uh, for their party. And I don't think anyone thinks America is a communist society. 20 years ago, when I was the MP in Brent East, the right-wingers stood a candidate against me. I thought they had a right to do that, so I don't know why they're whining now. Oh, it's lovely to be back. Thanks, sir. An MP's seat shouldn't be a job for life. And when you've got MPs saying Jeremy isn't fit to govern, they can't complain if people want to get rid of them. I mean, the simple fact is, but when we criticised Tony Blair, it was about policy. We weren't challenging him as a person. These embittered old Blairites can't stand the fact that Jeremy is bringing back democracy to the party, not just allowing them to actually decide who they want as a candidate, but also a say in policy and a say in the election of the Shadow Cabinet. Ah. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Cheers. madness to say that the PLP should elect the Shadow Cabinet because it's the most right-wing PLP you've ever had. All through the Blair and Brown years, local parties weren't allowed to choose the candidate they wanted. They had to pick from an approved list. So you got stuck with Douglas Alexander or something even worse. Sorry, thank, ah, you. Thank, thank you, you kindly. Thank you. Lovely. Jeremy's going to win by a landslide on Saturday, and I think that'll be the most significant event in human history since our ancestors came down from out the trees. The Labour Party isn't going to split. These embittered old Blairites remember when the SDP was created 35 years ago, giants, Roy Jenkins, Shirley Williams, David Owen, the whole country knew who they were, but they were you know, completely wiped out in a few years. And the people stabbing Jeremy in the back now, no one's heard who they are. Ah, wonderful. Although the party isn't going to split, Jeremy's re-election is the right time to crack down on those who are undermining us and helping the Tories soar ahead in the polls. You win some, you begin to lose some. Ah, oh, with thanks to the Red Rose Tandoori on the Holloway Road and Ken Livingston, who's so old Labour, he's brand new again, joins us <laughs> now. Welcome back to the programme. Lisa, do, if Mr Corbyn wins big on Saturday, does that start the healing process or does it leave Labour more divided than ever? I think it depends how we all respond to it. So if he wins again, then it's obviously incumbent on everybody in the Parliamentary Labour Party mm. to accept that result and to try to be constructive and to make it work. And it's incumbent on the leadership as well to try and reach out to parts of the party that have lost faith and to think seriously about how we move forwards and how we win a general election and for me that's got to start actually 
with something that is sort of the opposite of what Ken was arguing for there, which is about trying to calm this debate down, stop threatening deselections and talking about backstabbers and that kind of violent, abusive language and start thinking seriously, all of us, about how we move forwards and how we become not okay. just a decent opposition to this government, but a it's, genuine alternative. It's kind of hard to see peace breaking out if there's going to be a raft of deselection attempts. Well, when we introduced automatic reselection back in the 80s, there was a handful. I don't even think more than five MPs got deselected. I, and I just think it's a principle. I mean, I did not object when right-wingers put up candidates against me for reselection. I think you've got a right to do that. So I've always been in favour of this. I think the vast bulk of Labour MPs will get behind Jeremy because they desperately want to I mean, win the next election. We've got to start focusing on economic policy, not all the, the trivia. But there'll be a group that are still grumpy and, you know... And should they be deselected? Or well, would they only have themselves to blame if they were deselected? They only have themselves to blame. I mean, there's been real shock amongst Labour Party members that all of this new campaign, election campaign, has been triggered. I mean, we, we elected Jeremy just a year ago with mm. like, nearly virtually 60% of the vote. Um, and and you some, didn't, didn't he want annual elections at one stage? I mean... I, 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 he may well have done. I mean, we've all had lots of different I'm policies I'm sure there's no the appetite for that <laughs> these days, well, is there? I mean, in the old days, of course, it was just MPs, so it, it could all be done quite quickly. Yeah. Now it's incredibly expensive. This must be costing uh, a, a million pounds and at least. And time-consuming yeah, yeah. as well. Will the majority of Labour MPs rally around Mr Corbyn? I think I've not met a single person, actually, in the Parliamentary Labour Party or members who want to see the Labour Party split. Mm. So I think the only way forward for Labour, whoever mm. wins, is to be constructive and to create a much less toxic environment in which so, we can listen to one another and learn from one so another. So if, if asked, will you rejoin the Shadow Cabinet? Well, I think it's pretty unlikely for a number of reasons. Firstly, no, but, 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 but let's just assume the unlikely. Assume in this uh, outbreak, outbreak <laughs> of uh, era of new change, feelings in the Labour Party that you are asked, would you accept? I think it's unlikely because I didn't. No, no, I've not asked you that. I'm just asking you. If, it, if the unlikely becomes the actually happens, yeah. would you accept? No, and I'm, I'm trying to answer the question. I mean, Ken said that he, that, you know, the, the, the disagreements were always over policy. I didn't resign from mm. Jeremy's front bench, actually, because of policy. I resigned when it became clear at the meeting that I had with him mm. and John McDonnell that they saw this as a war in which dissenting voices sure. need to be silenced. It's, it's late at night. I'm just looking for a simple answer, well, yes or you know, no. I would, join, I would join a shadow cabinet, a genuine team that was working together and debating the future of the party. What I'm not that interested in doing is joining a fan club. I think that's a no. I think that's, that's a no. Is it not? Do you think that's a no? No, I hope, I hope Lisa will join because, I mean, let's remember, when Jeremy won, he reached out to an awful lot of people that I mean, completely disagree with him politically. And, I mean, I've always... I was really... My, my wife and I went out for a meal with Jeremy years ago and on the way home she said, that's the nicest man I've ever met in my life. I thought, thanks, dear. Well, nicer than you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And this is the thing. Jeremy is generally a nice person. He all will right. desperately reach out and try and bring them all back. And if they say no, that's wrong. This is too easy for you lot, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's a disaster for democracy and it's a disaster for the Labour Party. I think what will happen is I don't think the Labour Party will split. I think people do realise that really would be fatal. Um, but I think Corbynism will be tested to destruction. I think they will... Labour will lose badly at the next election, whenever it is, probably 2020, if Jeremy Corbyn carries on as leader. I'm not saying that as a smug Tory expecting to beat Labour. I think that is what will happen. And at that point, hopefully, the Labour Party will find a leader who can lead them out of this wilderness they've uh, wandered into, because it is very bad for the country and it's very bad for a great party, which is being destroyed from within. What does it mean when uh, Jeremy Corbyn and John MacDonald talk about mobilising a mass movement beyond Parliament? Well, this is, I mean, we're never going to be able to win an election because of fair coverage in the newspapers. I mean, it's overwhelmingly hostile. And the way we can win an election is building a good um, grassroots machine. I mean, when I lost the last election to Boris, the polls that week had him six to 12 points ahead. 
but in the end it was only 3%. And that wasn't because the polls were wrong, it was just we'd built a really good machine, <laughs> thousands of people getting the vote out, and that's the most important thing in actually winning. But even if you were to do that, what is the evidence that Mr Corbyn could win the next election? Oh, I wouldn't have voted for Jeremy if I didn't think he could win. So what's the evidence? The evidence is on the economic policy. I mean, he's broken from all the old Blairite nonsense of the neoliberal economic agenda. It's about investment, rebuilding our, our, our manufacturing base, modern new high-tech industries, and building council homes that our children can afford I to mean, live in. The, to be fair though, Ken, we were saying that before the last general mm. election, and it was roundly rejected by the public. And actually, the bigger issue for me is not that that programme was wrong. Mm. I don't think it was wrong. It's that we failed to convince people. And one of the reasons that I think mm. we failed to convince people wasn't because we we weren't knocking on enough doors, but because actually we hadn't built a broad alliance that could reach oh. into different parts of the country. That's why Sadiq at the mm. moment is mm. the most you mean by Sadiq Khan, the London mayor. successful yeah. Labour politician I, in the country I'm because saying, he's managed to create that broad alliance behind Labour his candidates ideas. candidates in marginals all over the country in, in the last general election. Yeah. And all over the place people said, what did the last Labour government do for me? And that, I think, poor old Ed Miliband was bearing the burden of that we didn't. We allowed manufacturing to continue to collapse as it had started under Thatcher. We didn't build council housing, and we didn't restructure the economy away from the Thatcher. Well, don't well, get all, Thatcher so all, died, all of that I agree with, but don't yeah. forget too that we brought in the minimum wage, which completely transformed the prospects mm. for a lot of my constituents in Wigan. We built mm. hospitals. You know, Cameron said that we but didn't fix the roof while the sun was shining. We actually expensive. built those buildings from the ground up, and 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 made sure that we invested mm. in people but to run can you really, it can made you really, a huge difference mm. i mean without your kind mm. of person running the labor party labor won three elections in a row mm. uh can you really win another election by essentially running again the record against the record of the last labor government i think you've got to admit we made a lot of mistakes we did some good things but all governments make mistakes I, but the key ones we didn't restructure our economy we carried on in all of the bankers, and that, that's the anger people feel. What other, major, what other major Western economy has reversed the decline in manufacturing industry? Precisely, and that's, that's why Donald well, there, Trump there might become one. president. That's why you've got all you mean, over Europe... You mean there isn't one? No, no, we have... We've Advanced economies, the manufacturing industry does decline. It's a feature of advanced no, no. economies. There's a high-tech modern manufacturing. If oh. you look at Germany, its manufacturing base is two and a half times the size yeah. of ours. And that's no, uh, very good for you. And it's they export five times the amount to China that we do. They have not... Germany's never allowed the bankers to run their economy. Can you win with... Well, you actually ought to see the trouble Deutsche Bank is in right now. Can you uh, win with uh, Jeremy Corbyn as leader? Well, we can win... Will you win? Well, we, we, we will win if we start talking seriously about what the economy of the mm. future looks like. So we've got to get beyond the anti-austerity slogan, mm. which captures, well, as Ken said, a lot of the anger. Mm. But we need okay. to start thinking about where are the jobs of the future coming, not just about right. policies like reopening yeah. the coal mines, but actually let's start thinking about how we're going to okay. create clean energy jobs. OK, we shall see. Ken Livingston, thanks very much. Cheers. And we, uh, we got through nine minutes without mentioning Hitler. <laughs> oh, I think I just did. Do you want me to respond? No. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> see what he says. Because it's late. <laughs> Too late even for Ken Livingston to talk about Hitler. Or to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. But don't despair. No, you can't equate those two. I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, I certainly wouldn't do that. But it's interesting in your mind that suddenly he did. I've been